So I just come up, like, there's the darkness with the wings. And as soon as it was this big black thing standing in the wings, and I go, what's that? And I was like, that's strange. And I go, I look like an elephant. And I go, holy. <laughs> and I was like, what? And then I was like, I realized, oh, I'm at the circus. But I was like, yeah, they should have told me. I just bumped into the elephant. <gasps> like, what's an elephant doing into the wings? It's like, this is not a cruise ship, this is a circus. Oh, brilliant. Love it. <laughs> Boom! And welcome back to um, season four of Meet the Entertainers. I've taken a two month break over the Christmas and the carnival period. It's good, 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 good. Obviously, I've forgotten how to speak. It's good to know that I'm still ranked number nine in the Performing Arts and Podomatic podcast, so uh, thank you for all your support. Uh, brand new features this season, including asking the performer what they have in their bag. Okay, that sounds... Does that sound slightly more, more um, professional? A little bit, right? Because, let's be honest, this isn't professional, yeah? This is not. Everybody knows I'm just basically sitting in my room, talking into my phone. Embrace the homemade aspect of the podcast, yeah? The more homemade, the better. Let's drop the phone. There we are. That's me dropping the phone, eh? You can't get more homemade than that. Look, listen, I'm really excited. Season four is going to be a great one, and we're starting off with a really, really good interview. It's not often you meet a world record holder, and uh, when I was a kid, uh, juggling was my biggest, biggest hobby. And, um, well, to meet someone who holds uh, world records in juggling is, is great. And I got to talk uh, to um, an amazing juggler, great performer, all-round fantastic guy, uh, Niels Danker. So here it is, my interview with juggling extraordinaire, Mr. Niels Danker. Take it away, Niels. If people want to um, contact you, uh, what is the best way to reach you? Okay, so I have my website, comedyjuggler.com. Yep. And my information is on the contact page yes. of that website. And how on, how did you get started on this, um, this amazing career it's uh something i ask everybody because it's a very unusual career the things that we do how did you get started well, well when i was uh, as a kid you had the rotterdam street performing festival yeah and my dad always took me there and i really liked seeing the jugglers mm. and then there was for a while there was a uh, some of the shops you could buy juggling balls it was a bit of a hype in holland mm. around 98 and then i got myself a set and i really got hooked and i kept going yeah how did you, um, ha do you have um, any particular ways of, of practicing, practicing juggling? Um, well, in the beginning, I really was watching all the videotapes from uh, Anthony Gatto, and yeah. he explains how to, how he practices. So I just kind of followed the same structure. Yeah. So he said, like, start with lower numbers first, then move up to bigger, bigger numbers. And he warmed up always with the balls. And then I think he did, then he did the clubs, and then... He did the rings, but normally I do the balls first, then I do the rings, and then I finish on the clubs. Mm. And he said, like, the clubs just takes more energy. So, uh, yeah, like, save that for the end, so you can, all your leftover energy, you can put in that crop. You must have spent, like, a, three or four years to get some of the, like, the seven ball stuff and the seven, seven objects juggling. Yeah, I started practicing 20 years ago. Yeah. And I've done, like, four years and gears, like, about two hours a day. Yeah. You were practicing two hours a day for... Do you still practice two hours a day, or are you at a level where you're, you're just ready to do shows? Uh, well, it's, it's tough now. In the, in the summer, at the Comedy Barn Theater in Pigeon Forge in Tennessee, Yeah. we do two shows a day, so I have to be at the theater around 3.30, Yeah. I'm there until 10.30. Yeah. So that's, that's a pretty long day. So then if, you, if I practice too much in the morning, like I just start to feel like it's not good for my for my body so you have to kind of slow down on the practice on the double show days if we do that for three four months in a row but then when we only do one show a day then i can practice like an hour and a half in the morning i'd love to get specific stuff and so let's say um if you are showcasing yourself to a, a client is there something is there a specific juggling trick that you that you think would really impress a client it's not something you're, on, you're not doing a stage show but you're trying to impress a new client or something uh, well, I think for the client, like, there's so many different shows and there's so many different clients. So what I always do when it's a new client, I always look what's important to this client. So, yeah. for example, if it's if they only need a seven-minute act to the music, which is pretty rare these days, but if they only need that, then, okay, 
do they need big tricks? Do they need like some maybe if it's a big venue, maybe if it's a halftime show or something, they need really big stuff. So you go, okay, that's because they need to fill that space. So I need yeah. to do the big tricks. Yeah. If it's uh, if it's maybe a twenty minute a show at a theme park for for family audiences, then they maybe want an audience uh, routine with one of the kids from uh, up on stage, and they become the star of the show. So like, okay, that's very important that there's a lot of interaction, and then I do a routine like that. So always look what's important to the client, and how can I fit uh, my repertoire of routines? What can I show that will really impress them? So there's just not one one specific trick. Right. It's just right. Like, I, yeah, that makes perfect sense. I get a lot of success now with the, the juggling cups. It's something I really like. Yeah. And it's not that many. So now I always look what's with tricks because usually if you, people don't know much about juggling, normally the more props you juggle, they think that you're a better juggler. Yeah. And um, that's that's pretty safe bet. And also with that's with magic. There's so many different tricks. So if you do a specific trick, that's like if, if the agency has 10 magicians, but you have one special trick or a couple of special ones that clients really like, you're a bit of an advantage because if there's like tons of guys doing cards and you're the only guy that's not doing cards. If certain venues like a magician every year, but then they're, at one point they're done with the card magic, then boom. The same with the juggling. There's so many guys doing balls, cups, oh, balls, balls, rings, and clubs. And then Freddie Kenton said, okay, if you start doing the cups, it's still a big trick. It's still stuff flying through the air. So people still think of it as juggling. Yes. But it's something that they have not seen so much. Now, and it kind of makes sense. If you want to apply, for example, to a cruise ship agent, they see so many juggling uh, j- videos of jugglers passing by. Mm. But then if you have a couple unique tricks, they go, okay, this adds something to my database because, I'm, yeah, this juggler can still pitch to all the clients that like jugglers. But it's a little bit different, so... If they already have used the other 10, then we have something that we can still make a sale with. Mm. Just to jump in here, I want to get the names right. That's Freddie uh, Kenton, yes? Yes. Okay, I'll put the names in the in the info to this, this podcast. And okay, yes, cool. juggling, uh, the juggling cups, yeah, that is quite unusual. And, and I'm wondering, I don't know much about the juggling cups. I've seen it every now and then. In fact, I saw a guy from Holland who makes the Sem unicycle, Sem Abraham playing around some juggling okay. cups, I think, once. Yeah. Is it, where, where do, the, do you know where the juggling cups come from? Is it, a, is it more popular in Holland, or is it just something unusual all over the world? It's uh, pretty rare, because there's... I forgot the name. There's one guy that started doing it first, and then Rudy Cardenas, a Mexican circus juggler. Mm. He, uh, he worked with this guy, or saw it, or he stole it. I don't know. Like he, he really started working it, and he was working all the big shows in Europe and in, in the United States. Yeah. So he made it more popular. And then Freddie Canton, when Freddie was uh, 16 years old, he saw this guy. Mm. And he then he started doing the cups. But still, it's like it's most cups that are made out of aluminum. Yeah. And every time you drop them, they, they bend. So it's just yes. a big pain in the... Because every time you need to get a new set, and they're yeah. very noisy. And so it's it's pretty inconvenient and for that reason not many people do it yeah and then for people who, who are maybe a magician or maybe someone who's listening who's not a, a juggler these are they're sort of cone-shaped cups and yeah. they, they can they're very easily um, stacked one in, in, into another so you can have a, yeah. a stack in your hand and you can and you can flip um, some of the cups out of that cup that you're holding in your hand and hopefully catch them again yeah, because of the cone shape and they're all stacked, so when you give it a, a swing, then the entire stack will fly out, they all make one spin in the air, and then they come back in reverse order. So because of the cone shape, they all have a different height, one spin and they come back. Yeah. And you you hold a world record, didn't you? You made, broke a world record for the cups, is that right? Yeah, I did 14. Wow, well, um, I've seen year. the video. <laughs> so that was that was really cool. Like it's That's one of the things that... I feel that I can still improve on that one. So, as a hobby, it's cool to kind of push yourself and to, to see how far you can get with that. Mm. But then also, professionally, it's still it's still cool if you do a trick in your show and you have the world record with that trick. Yeah. Some some clients are interested in that and they exactly for marketing purposes. exactly. Uh, we can talk about the marketing and the the use of the fact that you've got some world records. Is it four times Guinness world record holder? Is that right? I've set seven now. Seven now, wow. 
and you can show you can a clan any clans who's never heard of you, they'll see that you have seven set set, set seven yeah. Guinness World Records. And, play on, and they're gonna go, wow, we want this guy. Yeah, I think it's it's hard for variety acts like people that don't work so much with variety acts. How do, how can they explain who is better? Yeah, and if they want a good performer, yeah, then you can give you can give them some tools to for them to understand. Okay, this guy is good. So, it, yeah, in marketing, it plays very well. Is it true that an agent for an expo in China recommended you get some world records? I read that online somewhere. Yeah, he said like I said, okay, I really, I really like working in Asia. It's it's pretty cool. It's a different different world, as you know. Yeah. Than uh than Europe. I was like, that's that's kind of cool. I would like to do a couple more gigs here. So, so it's like, what can I do to help you um, sell me to your clients? And then he said, like in China, they're very competitive as well. And he said, if you if you get a Guinness World Record, that will make my job easier. Ah, and and has it has it worked over the years out over the years for you this uh, this uh, being, yeah I think yeah. I think it's good because it's like there's not that many juggling awards that people know but Guinness World Records is still an organization that everybody knows. So do you have to? How do you how do you go about that? Do you look in the record book and see if there's a record that you think you could you could get, and then you just how how do you and how do you officially get recognized? Yeah, there are different there are different ways. So one way is to look in the book or go on the website and just look at the records and then just if you think that's one I can have a go at just really start practicing until you you can break it and you how do you, you need to how, and how do you get it officially recognized do you have uh, to send so them a yeah, video this, this website guinnessworldrecords.com which is their official website yeah and then you can apply for a world record and they just have all the rules and they that they will tell you fascinating I never knew anything about this okay I, I might have got a world record I, I I'm yeah. doing I'm doing shows at the carnival in in Hong Kong, and okay. a lot of people say they've done one hour of roving, but I don't think they have done one hour because I, I timed myself with a stopwatch, and I got it down to one hour zero seconds and zero hundredths of a second. <laughs> That's the most precise trolling act. Yeah, so I was down to, I was down to the actual hundredth of a second. Yeah, and I I got my boss to to verify it with with, with, with my stopwatch. <laughs> that's that's crazy. Today, 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 I tried to go for the three-hour mingle, and oh, I was so close. I got it on my watch right here. I might put a screen capture on the somewhere on the, online. I got it down to two. I was trying to do three hours. I got two hours, fifty-nine minutes, fifty-nine seconds, point nine nine hundredths. So I was one hundredth out from the three-hour mingle. <laughs> and then, and then, and then your agent go. You didn't do three hours. No, I didn't make close. it. Yeah, I owe them. I owe them a, a, owe them a hundredth of a second. You've worked on. You worked on cruise ships. Is that right? Yeah, I did like about um, eight years full time on all the ships. Wow. So that was the main the main gig. I still did other gigs in between, but mm. that was the main one. Mm. So in two thousand and nine, I finished college. I did finished mechanical engineering. Mm. But and then the week thereafter, uh, my agent had set me up with a, a booking at Royal Caribbean. And that went well, and then I started working for Holland America Line too. That went well as well, and it just just grew from there. Wow. But uh, it's it's a pretty unique lifestyle. It, it's good. I'm I did one last month. I'm gonna do one in two and a half weeks time, and then I'm back in the United States, and I'm gonna do another ten months at the the show in Tennessee. Oh, but it's it's great. I saw a lot. I even went to Hong Kong one time with the with the ship. Hey. And. Uh, yeah, so it was cool. It's a good, it's a good way. It's a good venue to work at, okay. but um, it's a lot of traveling as well. So yeah, this is this is one of the few things that I haven't ever really experienced. I've done lots of stuff in my life, um, um, performing on different st kinds of stages for different functions and theaters. But I, I've never, I've never actually. I've been on small cruise ships for an evening, and, and they're a nightmare because the ceiling's too low and the boats rock. But I know yeah. I know nothing about uh, working on a big cruise ship. One, I'm probably not good enough, <laughs> and two, I have a family, so I, I wouldn't want to be away from them for that long. Yeah. But for for people like me who don't know, um, how many shows do you do a day? What's what's the deal? What 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 kind of work? Was it like working on a cruise ship long term? Well, it's it's the the, the performing schedule. It differs per cruise line, mm. and also it differs per cruise. 
So, for example, I go on a world cruise in two and a half weeks' time. Those passengers are there for three months straight, and they have a lot of sea days. They go all, all across the world. They visit, like... Yeah. So do you need to change your show throughout the, the cruise to, um, if it's well, the same audience? Well, they prefer because they, have, they fly in so many acts because they need to entertain those people yeah. for 90 days. Yeah. So there, if you have more shows, they're really welcome. It. So if you can do 245, so that means like the standard duration of a show on board the ship is 45 minutes. Mm-hmm. That's the evening show. Mm. And usually the acts repeat it for the early seating dinner. And yeah. the late seating dinner. Yeah. And um, but like on the shorter cruises and the bigger cruise ships, uh, very often they only want you to work one night, so you do one forty-five minute set. You repeat it twice in the evening, but then they want to show variety in the entertainment program. So they have a couple production shows and a couple guest entertainers. Yeah. That do their solo show, yeah. but then on those long, long cruises, it, it's great if you can do f- two evenings. Yeah. For a juggler to do 90 minutes of different material, it's very difficult. Yeah, I'm, that was my question. I mean, uh, a 45-minute show is already quite a lot um, for an audience to handle because, um, unfortunately, juggling, you know, if you've seen it for 5 or 10 minutes, the audience might be thinking it's time for something else. How do you make your show uh, long enough? Uh, well, there, yeah, there are different ways of juggling. Of course, you have the different props. Like if you do a uh, contact juggling routine, it looks totally different than juggling the clubs. Mm. And then the cruise ships have really nice venues as well, so with the lighting, the video projector. So there's stuff theoretically that you can put into the show too. For example, um, like magicians, if they do a card trick, they have the video camera film the card trick, close up on their hands, and they project it on the big video screen. Yeah, yeah. So with some juggling tricks, that's that's cool too. So then it looks more like a performing arts centerpiece. Mm. If you can. and then they have black lights. So with the LED, you can do LED juggling. It looks totally different again. Yeah. And then you have maybe a routine with a volunteer. You have a routine. That was another that's... question. I was looking at your videos, and I didn't see many volunteers in your shows. But you do you do have things with volunteers. Yeah, I do some. I like it's uh, especially in the US. People really like it. Yeah. But then also, I think, so some performers, if you have a routine, you need volunteers all the time. It looks like you have no skill yourself. Mm. So I, I don't want to, yeah, don't overkill with the volunteers, but do some because people like audience interaction. But I, I think in my, well, in my cruise ship show, I use, do one volunteer routine. So about six minutes out of those 45 minutes is involving an audience member up on stage and the other stuff is more yeah, interactive with talking to them, comedy. Okay, so you, do your audiences always speak English, or is it ever a problem that you have an audience which doesn't speak much English, or uh, any other well, language like, that you know? When I perform in the Netherlands, I have one show on Saturday, of course I speak Dutch, they speak Dutch, so they don't speak English, but I can communicate them no problem. In the US, they always speak English, mm. and on the cruise ship, it's a mixed audience. Yeah. So I did, two years ago, I did a, a three-week contract on board Star Cruises. And it was between Taiwan and Japan. And there, they didn't speak English. But then, like, I, juggling is very visual. And also what I learned when I was working three months in Team Park House and Bosch in Japan, you don't need language all the time. You can just, yeah. with, if you just act out stuff clearly, people can understand your intentions without you having to talk English all the time. Mm. And then the other stuff on that particular cruise ship, Star Cruises, the cruise director was also the interpreter. So some stuff if it got more okay. complicated, she would translate it. What's your favorite kind of microphone? Um, it's always an issue for me. Actually, I've got, it's a shame you can't see me. I've got a big bruised lip them and I bashed my... <laughs> I was using a wireless handheld microphone which I'd attached around my neck. And as I climbed onto my giraffe, I do a fake fall off where I kind of pretend to oh, fall, wow. fall off. But unfortunately, my the microphone bashed me in the in the in the face, so I have a big red lip. <laughs> what kind yeah, of microphone I, do you use? I have a uh, lapel mic. Uh, yeah, a really good one. But then for some outside gigs, like with the wind, it's not so good. Mm. But then when you work inside in a theater, 
that that's pretty good. It's just that sometimes with the, the sound tech, it's a little that one is a little bit more difficult for them to get the settings right. Yeah. So sometimes they tell me that the microphone is not good, but it's good. But then their expertise is not mm. good enough to to level it correctly. Yeah. So and on the lapel mic is 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 the main yeah, one you use. Yeah. For most jugglers, I think the lapel mic is the best. And your hand is your hands are free. Yeah. And your head is free. Like when you do the pirouettes or you do physical stuff, sometimes those mics, those headset mics, they're in the way. When you do a head juggling routine. Yes, it hats, of course. Way. It gets in the way of and hats all, all the time. Look, ideally, for indoor shows, uh, my lapel mic is the best. Yeah. Um, and let's talk about costumes as well. Um, you, I see, looking at you on, on online, mainly it's a simple simple black costume, maybe black trousers, black t-shirts, or... Uh, well, it depends on which venue. Like, it's... Uh, on the cruise ships, uh, I like to wear a suit. Mm-hmm. So, uh, and then at the comedy barn, it's uh, a comedy uh, barn. You've got like um, so I, I guess almost like a hillbilly American. Yeah, overalls. That's that's their theme. That's their selling point. Yeah. Every performing the show wears overalls, and the the theater looks like a big giant barn. So yes. That's the costume they prefer. So I think regarding the costumes, you want something that enhances your show. It doesn't, so it's, I have to stand out a little bit, so it's like, okay, this is the performer. Mm. And then also, it, it shouldn't distract from from your act, too. It should enhance it. Yeah. Like, if you, if, if you do the juggling, maybe you wear a big, a giant clown suit. It just, it's too much and distracts from from your juggling. Yes. But you go, what's the point? Like, the comedy barn, if that's the theme of the entire show, like a barn team show, then overalls makes perfect sense. That's and it right. enhances, it enhances the show. On the cruise ship, like you have formal nights, it's a kind of classy environment. Mm -hmm. So a suit uh, does the job really well, at least for my type of act. Okay. When you work maybe at a outside a strolling gig at a theme park, you want something colorful. Mm -hmm. and something. But it also depends what's what your character, what's your persona. Mm. Do you have any special requirements for your costume? Do um, the sleeves ever get in the way of, of juggling? Um, well, something with the suit. If you do, if I want to do the, the cups, the suit jacket, mm -hmm. it doesn't stress enough with the shoulders. So that's that's makes it a little bit more difficult. Yeah, so you always yeah. want to go for for a costume that physically enables you to do the to do the tricks that you want to do. What kind of um if you're doing juggling in the dark with some sort of global, so is there a favorite brand or type of global that you like to use? Uh, dif different brands for different reasons. All right. So when you fly a lot, like for to the cruises, you have to fly a lot. Yeah. So in the when you check in your luggage, it um uh, it can be very cold in that area. Oh, I love so this. You, Specific I had, like, tips. Very, very nice uh, juggling clubs with the battery inside, but then they just died sooner ah. because the battery hold, didn't hold a charge anymore because it just got abused in the cold right. of the, the ch so that's so now i have two different sets and now the, the the new rules with the airlines again which makes it more difficult because you cannot bring a club as hand luggage right on the airplane but now also at least in the u.s you cannot you cannot check battery powered devices right so oh if you my have goodness. a light club, it's, a, it's both a club and it's battery powered. Oh no! So you're, it's kind of kind of difficult. Right now, one time I had to fly with and I could... So I brought my nice ones because it was a short flight with the batteries that are inside. Yeah. But uh, yeah, right now for the cruise, that's what I had before. Um, just those, the cheapest light clubs, like the one-piece ones. Mm-hmm. And then you can just take the batteries out, pack them in a different compartment of your suitcase. And then the, those clubs are not battery powered devices anymore because the battery, you take them out, you store it separately. Yes. So then you're, you're complying with the rules and you can still bring them. The only yeah. problem is with those juggling clubs, the, the cheaper one piece clubs, the handles are so hard. So I was doing triple, like very fast triples. And yes. Five clubs with them and they're pretty heavy. Yeah. So then my, 
I got like a deep internal bruise on my hand just because they're so heavy and they, they hit my one part of my hand with the bone there all the time. So I know exactly what you're talking about. I love this. This is what I love. Specific stuff, yeah. I yeah, I so, know if you spin the juggling cup too hard, it really hurts the bones in your hands. So it, and then you do five I did five on the shows that year, so you don't want to be injured. No. So um so then for that show like the resident show in the US, I just bought an extra set of those really expensive, nice um, LED juggling clubs. Mm. They're a little bit lighter, the handles are softer, and uh, the light is brighter as well. So right now I have uh, my set of Dubai one-piece clubs for the cruises. Mm -hmm. And then for the resident show in the US, I have a set of, I think they're the brand is Cosmos. Okay. Cosmos juggling clubs, and I can just charge them and I leave them at the theater. Well, like it's now becomes more and more pain uh, flying with all your props. Just like, uh, like also joining the cruise ships with your juggling knives. They're not they're not dangerously sharp, but they look like a knife. So security always stops you, and you always have to wait until you get clearance for the ship. And then, so those juggling knives, almost every contract delays me an hour for an hour at the security. Wow, this Just is because fascinating. they want to know all the ins and outs of that prop. Yeah, yeah. And I have a few issues. I, like I said, I don't travel much. But if I get a, a fire show um, just over the border, say, because Hong Kong borders mainland China, and I have a fire show in mainland China, that's always like, ah, uh, what am I going to do for the, for, the, for the fire fuel? <laughs> I can't really yeah. take it through customs on the ferry. <laughs> Or maybe I can sneak it in and they won't notice. Yeah, it's always tricky. Yeah, those it's tough. And sometimes you can put it in your rider so the clients have to provide it stuff. But like regarding the fire, I prefer to stay away from it now. It's just Me too. Not worth the smell and the hassle. Me too. And uh, well, I'm 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 um. Were you born in the eighties, mid eighties, or something? I'm guessing. Eighty five. There you are, exactly in the mid eighties. I was born at uh, the uh, uh, nineteen seventy one. So, uh, so when I started performing professionally in Singapore, uh, in particular, there was no, there was a new, a new, um, there was no one else who had a unicycle in the whole country. Yeah. So they let me do anything I wanted, and I was juggling fire here and fire here yeah. and the smoke alarm fire here. But nowadays, there's so many restrictions. Oh, fair enough. And uh, also, I, yeah, I just don't like it. Everything got dirty. <laughs> Everything was covered yeah, in soot. Thanks. So that's, yeah, that's good. Now, so the knives, it's still good. You still have an element of danger. Yes. But uh, it's that's some something that can stop you too, and it's just annoying. Yeah. So now I had some something else that I was experimenting with for those gigs, those garden weasels. Um. Okay. Let's just jump in here a second. Um, garden weasels. Uh, you might want to Google that because uh, uh, honestly. I pretended I knew what Niels was referring to, but actually I haven't got a clue. So I googled it, and um, yeah, garden weasel, it's a gardening tool. If you just google it, garden, and then weasel, W-E-A-S-E-L, you'll see these, um, these, these sticks for gardening with these weird spiky bits on the end. So it's, uh, yeah, they'd be great for juggling with. Alright, so google that, have a look. If you go on my website and watch the video for this uh, podcast, www.thebigbenshow.com, uh, I'll put some images up of the garden weasel. Uh, <laughs> all right, let's go back to me, pretending I know what Niels is referring to. Something else that I was experimenting with for those gigs, those garden weasels. Oh, yeah. So if you put garden weasels on a the stick, they don't shoot. And there's something I'm going to experiment with. Yeah. So because I only need it for one trick, so it will do the job for that one trick. Um, but they don't show up on security as standard knives so they don't look like weapons they would look kind of exotic yeah so it's more you can if you tell them look it's a stage prop and they just look the points they're not super sharp they go okay whatever so yeah. that's my next thing if i need to fly with it again a lot yeah. and just for that one trick i already have a couple garden weasels yeah that's a great idea how about um music again this is something that's affected my career when i started no one there was no youtube no one worried about um, the copyright of, of music. You grabbed any music you liked. You put, um, you had it on a, on a on what they called an audio cassette, and you gave yeah. it to the MC, and they they put it in their stereo cassette player, 
and you could play whatever you want. You could play a theme tune, you could play Mission Impossible, you could play whatever you wanted. Um, but nowadays, I find it in particular all my YouTube videos, all my YouTube videos slowly get um, taken down for copyright reasons because most of my music is from uh, 20 years ago and it's all copyrighted. <laughs> so, do you have any copyright issues or do you get music written especially for yourself? Uh, I had done, uh, especially written like maybe on two occasions. Mm -hmm. And then further, if you can start with royalty free music, mm, yes, added in the accents, then that solves the problem too. Mm. And then if you can, yeah, like some databases, if you can look for like a certain mood, you can put in the duration, the mood and all that kind of stuff. Yes. And then you hit search and then you get a selection of music. And then if you can, yeah, just pick the music that that fits your act. You again are, are um, in a better position than me. I, I used to do one man shows traveling around, do birthday parties, turn up at shopping centers. So I have to, um, I don't, I don't have time to talk to the sound crew. I just say, here's my music, press play. Yeah. Um, do, do you have, because you're working on, on, on cruise, cruises and in theaters and you're working for uh, the Comedy Barn Theater, I'm guessing you have someone who knows all your music cues and can stop and start when you need it. Is that right? Um, or not? Sometimes, sometimes, sometimes not. Like it now, I, so before they had this MP3, MP3 tech, and now you also have the audio ape. So I bought an audio ape mm. system, which allows me to, to run my own sounds uh, through my iPhone on the sound system from the venue. Wow. So then I can do that myself. So then there's always somebody that knows my cues because that's all the time that's me on corporate gigs and stuff. Mm. But then in the theater, in the theater, the sound technician has seen the show so many times, so he knows. Yeah. So that's not that's easy. And then on the cruise ships, um, you, usually you give them a cue sheet off the show, and then you do a rehearsal. Yes, of course. And but then they all, that's the first thing they see the show. So sometimes they make a mistake, but they're good. So they've seen many shows. They get a feel for the shows. So usually that's that's good. On a comedy barn, it's great because they see the show every night. And then on one-offs, I use that uh, that system that I can do it uh, on my own wireless remote. How about your persona on stage? Um, you do sort of um, you do a bit of talking, stand-up comedy style talking between the juggling tricks. Has yeah. that been something you've done from from early on in your career? I uh, yeah. When I was uh, so in the first time I saw jugglers at the the Rotterdam Street Performing Festival, it was already that they were talking in between the routines or during the routines. So for me, that was the first impression of a juggler, mm. that, that style of performing. But yeah. it took a long time to actually develop it because in the beginning, you know, if you dropped your tricks all the time, it's very difficult to display your persona because you, the audience is so distracted by your lack of technique. So first you need to own that. Yeah. Only if you, the technique is so solid, then you have this extra energy you can give to uh, portraying your persona on stage mm -hmm. and uh, yeah usually like for me it works well if you're just like energetic friendly and then uh, like on the cruises and also in Tennessee with my accent it's kind of cool that you're from Holland like that's that's something special yes for international audiences so I play that up a little bit and yeah just look what's unique to you and then some stuff that people already remark on and then just you kind of address it already yourself and then make some jokes about it and that's out of the way and then you can entertain them yes you your you, your persona seems to be an extension of yourself you from what I see on, on online you seem very sociable uh, and very friendly and is, is that your persona on stage yeah I think I think if we're an entertainer we're there to make our day a little bit better yeah so we want to be friendly. Everybody likes friendly people. If you're personable, people really enjoy that too. So uh, yeah, I just want to be a friendly, energetic, open person on stage. And the same in the in the marketing. Like if you like how I see it, how you when you promote your show, like your website has to kind of like show the same character that you do on stage. Mm -hmm. They get three promotion material to get a feel for what they will get when they book your show. Yes. So that you cannot, if you're super grumpy as a business person, but then you want to be super friendly during the show, 
maybe you can do that if you work through an agent. But if you, yeah, just for, if you talk to producers and stuff yourself, it's much better if you're just like friendly all the way through. Amazing. That was my next question. Yeah, does it help your business being being nice to people? I th yeah, I think it's also just uh, c for congruency. Yes, for like congruency. Yes. That, that like that they through your, your promotional materials, they want to get a feel for your show. That's and very interesting. So you want to have the promo text and your your video kind of edited, your photos in the same style as how you're going to be performing. Yes. Yes, because people often say that they say, "Oh, you've got to." You've got to show that like when you market yourself, it's got to be, it's got to be one thing. Don't try to be everything. So in a sense, there's a common thread running through your for everything for you. Your person, your friendly, sociable personality is what they see on stage. It's what they see on your website. It's what they see if they meet you in person, and you're trying to market your show. Yeah, and I think when you're maybe when your character's not as much in line, if it's kind of like ex eccentric or whatever still be friendly and professional in the business side mm. but then there's no way like in the colors you pick for your website your logo all that kind of stuff it can be it can be kind of like your stage, stage character too it should mm. be but then of course you want to be friendly and professional that they can book you and be a, be a professional yeah. business owner but further display your product in your marketing you have a great um logo it's sort of an animated video logo i love it is that that lists n and d for your name with yeah. uh, juggling balls flying around it did you design Thank that you, yeah, did you invent that on yourself how did you get that made uh that's actually it's funny when i was 14 i was playing around in uh microsoft word and i came up with the same idea yeah. but then for years i did i never i never used it and then uh, my friend John Taylor, he's an illusionist, he had a really good logo, and he said, oh, we'll queue up with my graphic designer, that he found, he found him in the yellow pages, so he went through the like, yellow pages, and he went to the graphic depart graphic designer's department, mm. and then he just booked the, the graphic designer that has the best app, the best mm. designed app, he's like, okay, if they, they're probably going to design their own app, so I want the guy that has done the best job on that, so he hired that guy, he had a really good logo, and then he connected uh, me with him and then he came up with this logo and I go oh that, that's great and it also yeah it just it's, kind it's of a lovely logo it's really my good show and now it's the open now it's my logo animation it's the opening effect of my show yes with I got a big that big logo I got it built as my prop as a prop it's my prop stand on stage oh fantastic show. So it's yeah it's because now like Everywhere in my business, you you see my logo. So again, you have the the congruity. It's something that's there on your website, it's in your show. Yeah, it's yeah. brand. It's branding, isn't it? Yeah, it's good. And then I read in one business book, it said too, like if you get tired of your logo, don't change it out, because that's if you get tired of it, that's just the moment that everybody kind of starts to recognize it. Ah, there you are. That's a good point. I like that. Yeah, it, just because you're tired of it doesn't mean that anybody else is. People are starting to recognize no, it. All the people that don't care as much about your business as you do, they finally start to pick up on it. So just keep it because, yeah, you have mm. invested so much in it. Now you finally start getting the rewards from it. Mm. Talking about more, so, again, about uh, marketing and social media, you have quite, you're like me, you're a bit of a, a YouTube addict. You have lots of videos on YouTube, really good ones. You've got, you've got YouTube juggling tutorials. Yeah, those, those do very well for me. Yeah, some of them have got like 40,000 plus more than that um, views. It's amazing. Yeah, one one has like 850,000 now. Wow. <laughs> so, yeah, it's, it's good. Like, I, I was thinking, for the juggling tutorials, I'm, I'm going to make the best videos that I can. Mm. So, basically, if I would be selling it, um, what, like... 100% the best quality. What do people expect? I'm just not holding back and then I'm going to give it away for free. Yeah. And so and people people are really, are really happy now with it. Like it's uh, my five ball juggling tutorial has over half a million views. And uh, so basically it's a very specific video. Five ball vi tutorials. So people are only going to watch it if they are interested in learning five balls. Yeah. Which is kind of the difference between a beginner juggler and becoming a really good juggler. Man, maybe I should have watched that 25 years ago when I spent a year in my office trying to <laughs> juggle five balls. If, you, if only YouTube videos yeah. had been around. Oh, dear. Yeah, if YouTube was there. <laughs> but it's, it's good. Like, so many people, colleagues, and 
Now when you go to juggling clubs, like a, every juggling club, a couple of people have watched those videos. So it's, ah, it's, it's really cool when you travel lovely. and you go to a local juggling club and the people already know you. You're that guy. You're that guy. You made a YouTube you video. Yeah. They're, they're friendly to you because of that reason. It's, it's kind of cool. So, yeah, that's great. So, I mean, I was thinking that it's good publicity and it, maybe it's your passion, but it's also just you go to a juggling club and it's just... It's just lovely that people will have seen your videos and, and, and know you in a way already. Yeah, and then also, like, promo promotion-wise, like, if you never know. Like, some people, like colleagues, if they learn a trick from you, from those videos, that means it's a, it's a positive anchor in their mind towards my towards me. Yes. So maybe later, too, if, if they need a gig and they need to book somebody, go, oh, we know that name, we, we like that name. So, and that could 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 lead to gigs as well. So you're saying someone, some kind, of, some potential client might see your video, and and be impressed by by the juggling tutorial, and that might lead to to a contract and paid work. Yeah, it could be, and yeah. also just exposure on the internet. Well, yeah, I mean, and, and exposure's when great. When you do you do juggling workshops as well. Like if if you can tell a client, look, these are my instructional videos. This is the style that I'm teaching in. That it shows indirectly. It's almost like a promo video that they can see that you know what you're talking about. Do, so, do you do you uh, are you a professional? Do you run professional juggling workshops as well as being a performer? Um, yeah. So I have I have my shows and I do my workshops. Oh. So uh, I have jugglingworkshop.com, and that's the website for my workshops. I'm just going to repeat that jugglingworkshop.com. Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. So what are your sources of income? I thought it was just performing, but you have also from workshops. Do you have any other sources of income? Uh, I, I have uh, the, the, the shows according to different venues, cruise ships, uh, the theater in the U.S., some corporate events, then the workshops. And then I, I tried to, uh, yeah, Dick Franco, when I started performing, he, uh, 10 years ago professionally, he said, like, uh, okay, now you finally have a, like a longer term professional gig so uh, yeah it's trying to save your money because it's 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 pr it's pretty tough late someday you want to retire if you start saving now and start investing it wisely yeah and then the chance that's with the juggling in one day you can you can retire of it yeah we're gonna go so, back uh, to uh, social media and marketing in a minute normally I end with um, the future but let's go into the future yeah there's there is the thing if you're a performer and you're a physical performer such as a juggler, uh, you do have to think about your future. I, I don't think many entertainers think about it straight away when they're in their teens and their 20s. But as you get older and closer to 50, 60, you realize there will be a physical limit um, to, the, to certain tricks. Um, they'll become harder to do and you won't want to do those things. Do you have any thoughts about the future or are you still way too young to think about that? Well, I think also instead of just like your physical limitations, just now, with the way the world is moving, everybody's used to looking at apps all the time. Yes. YouTube, all that stuff. If you see those YouTube channels with all this amazing stuff, then for us, if you juggle five balls, four balls, three torches, it's not as amazing anymore. That's true in because the they. Mind as it used to be. I remember Anthony so Gatto talking about that. He found it quite frustrating that people will put up a video of them juggling some nine object or something. And he'd point out that it's the video isn't the same as seeing someone do it do it live. Yeah. So like people, people that like amazing stuff. They don't see it as hundred percent amazing anymore very quickly. Yeah. They don't realize so, in uh, order to get that video, someone's someone's probably taken about five hundred takes to get it finally right. Just yeah. once. <laughs> so and then and have you look at it like yeah some of the the festivals and events. Like when I was a kid, there were more street performing festivals. Mm. There are not so many street performing festivals. Like variety theaters, there are not that many variety theaters. Sure, there's changes. I mean, I started, I, I started by chance because I was happened to be in Singapore in 1994 with a unicycle and someone saw me uh, riding my unicycle along the street and said, can you do a show? And I went, yeah. And for about 10 years, there were masses of shows in the shopping centers in Singapore, but not anymore. Things trends come and go. Yeah. So, like with uh, I think for me, like I expect to have another ten years mm -hmm. 
real stuff. But then also after, you know, I think in about 10 years, the venues that you can just work steadily on a respectful level. Mm-hmm. Is, it, yeah, it's going to be tough. So it's like after about 10 years to really enjoy it. And then maybe when you're, when I'm around 40, maybe you don't want to be juggling all the time anymore. Mm. Just to keep it as a hobby, but not having to go to some kids' birthday party, street performing, all those kind of venues, or even flying to World of Cruise Ships. Then you go, okay, cool, I can still, you know, do it when there's good opportunity arises. Yeah. And then further just practice for fun. Yeah. And then run another business on the side. Yeah, yeah, run another business. Do you have any idea what, what you do? Um, what your other right business now, would be? I, I think the marketing stuff is pretty cool. I yeah. really enjoy that. Yeah. Prop building is pretty cool. I really like now that, yeah, I was working on a couple book projects. That's pretty cool too. So I'm learning a lot of stuff about that as well. But I think probably the marketing and the, the PR and stuff. Mm. I think just the, the, the way it goes, like more you, or like with the YouTube, Instagram, blogs, all that stuff, people just need, it becomes so difficult to get attention for any project. Mm. So if you're good at drumming up attention for a product, then there should be, there should be some market in that. Yeah. And to be money to be made in, in that, in advertising or something. Mm. So I think between, as a performer, we, we're performing, we're showing our skill, we're selling something to the audience so we know how to grab their attention to keep their attention yeah and we with the joke writing we have a better feel what people think it's it's funny and interesting yeah so yeah. maybe with that like with the creative thinking and just showing something unusual to the audience if you can instead of doing it on a stage maybe do it on the internet somewhere yeah and do that for another client and then just be an ad, ad guy and just when a good opportunity for a show comes take it and further just enjoy the juggling mm. just have fun with it talking about enjoying stuff and having fun uh, on social media I, I, when I was just randomly flipping through YouTube about you I saw a, <laughs> I saw a funny video about a social experiment juggling versus magic make, which makes more money <laughs> yeah it was uh, my friend Rockus. I'm doing a show with him in the United States in April oh brilliant and um yeah, he said, like, oh, we should do that, that's fun. And we knew we were not going to make uh, much money with it. It was not the point. It was just, yeah, to do something weird and see how many views we can get on YouTube. It's so a funny it was, video. <laughs> so while we were performing for those people on the street, it was more that we were performing for potential future viewers on YouTube. Yeah, yeah. Um, ventriloquism is a hobby for you, question mark. Is that right? Uh, well, I, I was playing with it for a little bit. Because that one, you, that one you could do for a long time, I think, a ventriloquist. Yeah, but it, it freaked me out. <laughs> because I, at one point, I became better and better at it. So at one point, like with the juggling, when you get better and better, at one point you don't have to think about all the trolls and the moves. Yeah. They go automatically. Yeah. Same with ventriloquism. Like the dummy started moving almost automatically by itself. <laughs> and that freaked me out because it was still some kind of part of me that was controlling it, but mm. it was kind of moving on its own. Mm-hmm. So it's like, it felt very uh, schizophrenic. So I was like, okay, I need to stop. This is, <laughs> this is weird. I, I do a bit of ventriloquism as well as a hobby, but I always found yeah. it's much easier to do it, uh, much easier to practice. But uh, getting on stage is way harder to be to be a ventriloquist, <laughs> okay. because the heart beats faster, and the lips start moving, and you can't. Yeah, it's very. I found it very tricky on stage. So I, yeah. I, I take my head off to people who can do it professionally. Very hard. Yeah. yeah, it's cool. It just freaked me out. It's like, I need to stop. Okay. And uh, I was practicing a little bit on the cruise ship. It was funny. The cruise director was like, okay, are you, are you getting so lonely now that you're you're taking a dummy with you <laughs> so you can get somebody to talk to? And I was like, okay, time to move on. Talking about books, you've got a, you've got a few books, right? Catch My Greatness, is that one? Catching greatness, catching yeah, greatness, that's, that's it. Yes, catch I wrote a couple writing. years ago. Yeah. Like um, so, Barry Friedman from Showbiz Blueprint, he uh, was coaching me for for quite a while, and he's like, okay, th- your life is pretty amazing, for, especially for like teenagers that don't travel that much and just need to find a path in life. Mm. So he's like, if you write a book, you, you can show them that if you really like some something and just go for it with hard work and discipline, you can just achieve it. So just yeah, instead of like playing all your energy, putting in video games, just there's the world is bigger than that. 
So I'm just so, going to put uh, a name down here. Barry Friedman, I'll put him in the notes. That's um, his website, www.getmorecorporategigs.com is a good one, right? Yeah, that's uh, his older website. And then he has a newer one, showbizblueprint.com. Right, right. And then, uh, so that was one book. And then another book I just wanted to, to write. And that's now we're selling it at the Comedy Barn. It's just a, a Learn How to Juggle book. Mm. And I packed it with a little comedy routine. So I gave the kids the the tools how to learn how to juggle and then a little routine that they can perform as well. Mm. And I tr- threw in a little bit of the history of juggling, a couple of juggling cartoons about me. So basically it's a, it's a little fun book as merchandise after the shows. I think it's wonderful. And I think just making a book... Um, in itself is worthwhile does it also financially make sense um yeah it's good like uh you need to have a venue where you can sell it mm. like if you just only have it on amazon not many people will will buy it that's right they won't but find if they, it if you build a, a a relationship with the audience on stage and then you ha- they want to take something home as a souvenir that's from the show right. that's how to sell a book of course it is yes they see then, your show um, yeah, and then, then your you book's available board. in the foyer. Yeah. Oh, wonderful. And then the, the other book that I'm very proud of is uh, Help My Friend Carl Heinz Seaton. Uh, published his latest book. It was, it's 600 pages. It's about the history of juggling. Mm-hmm. It's uh, the most comprehensive book about the history of juggling ever written. And wow. it, was a, it was a big project, but uh, that's available from jugglinghistory.com. Okay, just repeat the name again, jugglinghistory.com and the name of the book. It's uh, juggling the past and the future. Fantastic. Brilliant. Um, unscrupulous agents. How do you make sure you get paid? Question mark, exclamation mark. Well, for, for me, I the agents that I'm working with, they're really good agents. Right. So I made sure that I just, like the guys that can represent me, I want them to be the top players mm-hmm. in, their, in their field. Mm-hmm. So uh, since they're the top players, they're honest guys, and they have good clients. Yeah. Um, influences. Um, choreographer and magician Joni... Is it... I can't remember writing. Spina? Spira? Um, yeah, so look, when I... In the beginning, there's it's so difficult to make a living with the shows. Mm. And there's so much stuff you don't know. So... Uh, when I started working on the ships, it was a new, a new beast for me. So I was mm. like, okay, how can I make my show the best it can be? Mm. So I was lucky that I was on board with illusionist John Taylor. He helped me a lot getting onto the ships. Right. Then at the same time, um, Magic Magazine was still around. Right. And Joni Spina was a very. She worked for David Copperfield for many, many years. Yes, I read her obituary, and it. She seems extraordinary. So um, yeah, it's just really great. And then she had this this awesome product she was offering. So for five hundred dollars, I could send a video of my show, and she would critique it and send me back all kinds of show notes. Mm, mm. So th- just that one session kept me busy for two and a half years just Brilliant. to implement all those changes. Yeah. Wow. And then uh, Dan Holtzman helped me too. Like uh, he has a service for that too. It's called BrainDrizzles.com. Yep. And he uh, helps you with comedy writing, and he teaches you how to write more comedy. I googled Daniel Holtzman and I, I instantly recognized his face. I can't remember where I saw him though, but yeah, I recognized the guy. Yeah, yeah, he is uh, very memorable with his voice and he's very smart with that too. So uh, so he helped me for a couple of years. We did like a, a call every, every month or a couple of times a month and he just explained me how I was thinking and we went for my show and we just worked on it. Mm. Um, how important is originality? I've read that you have had experience of another performer stealing stealing an act of yours. Um, yeah, that's that's annoying. It's a bit of a compliment as well that they like the idea so much that they think it's worthy in their show. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, but I think just professionally, like, look, if you're if you have a show but it looks the same like all the other shows. What's mm. the reason why one client would book you over the other guys? Yeah, yeah. So if your show is more unique or better, uh, both, then you just stand a bigger chance of getting the bookings. All right. 
So I think for self, it's, it's, it's just as a selfish reason, it's good to be original. How, how do you start on stage? Do you start with no, lots of example, music? For example, with the, with the ships, first I was uh, just doing my show. Just starting it the normal way, like you come on stage, you start with your first routine. But then on the ships, they they like if you if you they think they can they're looking at a star, they like to show more. Ah. So instead of a jugger or they look, oh, this is this guy. Then they enjoy the show more. So I have in the Netherlands tons of uh, TV appearances. Right. So then we added the video, like a minute of showing just highlights of those TV clips. Oh, great! Playing that before the show builds. Yeah. yeah. Sets better first impression yeah yeah then when yeah. you start the show they already they like it more because they think oh this guy is famous so they're gonna enjoy it more oh yeah instead of this is just a jogger well, i could do that somehow I've, i haven't got many tv clips but i've got radio clips and things so i could play an audio yeah, for his radio can, clips and even if you just start with like okay a bit about a back about your background voice over mention some of your credits and all the stuff so just build like yes. celebrity status in the audience minds and people think it's a great show because you're famous. Right? Yeah, because it, it is all a, it is all about making them see you as a dazzling, amazing performer, and anything that, yeah, and then, that helps set the scene for that is, venue, is great. Any venue is different, so you always look what's what does it need for this venue. But mm. for the cruise ships, that was a very good change to begin like the show. Yeah, and then thereafter, a lot of people because they don't buy tickets to that show. They come late to mm. the show sometimes. Yes, yes. So I'm, I hate when I'm juggling and have all these people moving in the audience. Right. It just distracts me because peripheral vision, it just distracts me. Mm. So, but also people really like the LED juggling. Mm. So I started down with a short two to three minute LED juggling routine, mm -hmm. which is a little bit more unique. People don't see that often. Yeah. And it's still dark in the theater. So those people who come late, they have another two, three minutes to find a seat without distracting me. Oh, that's, that is fantastic. I love it. This is why I love doing these podcasts. Yes, of course. If you don't want to see the audience coming in, do a, do a, a routine that's uh, in the dark with the glowing, with LED. Brilliant. Love so, it. So I do the video. And then, um, but then also it was important, another 15 seconds between the video and going into the blackout, uh, and I come on stage, I can say, hello, welcome to the show, you're going to have a great time. Yeah. And then because then at least they see that it's me, otherwise it's too much. Then it's about four minutes off the show. This is my show that they have not seen me. Right. Which is, so it's good to connect real brief uh, with them, and then just go into the... Into yes, I understand, because if, the, if you have the video and then straight into the darkness, they still wouldn't even actually seen you in person. And then my opening bit... Like my the logo, my A ND logo. Yeah. There are juggling balls in my logo, so I have my um, my logo is is in my prop case, and then I take the juggling balls, which are glow balls, out of my logo. Oh, lovely. And then it, so it just ties together the same the pre-show look of my show. Yeah. It's that animation of my logo that the balls shoot out of the logo, and then I do the TV clips, and then my opening effect is that I take the balls out of my logo and I start juggling those balls. Ah, so it's, it's kind of comes full circle. Great. So you've got the LED. Um, uh, what what happens after that? The light that well, then thereafter, on. I just want to build a relationship with the audience. Mm -hmm. So I uh, I have a couple jokes about being from Holland and all that stuff. So they they get a feel for the person, the performer they're gonna watch mm -hmm. that show. Yeah. And then. I go to a smaller bit, then I wanna, then I go to the contact juggling for a short minute, mm -hmm. which is cute. It also tells them that this is not like any other juggling show. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit more artistic. And then I do the, the head juggling. Mm -hmm. So then I go from one to to three objects. But then it's still it's it's quite flashy, so they know okay this guy he's good and yeah. it's different than all the other jugglers. And then I go to five ball juggling. So I have a couple more jokes to show my character, and then I go to five, so that's more proof of skill. So then, yes. okay, this guy has his stuff down. And then uh, and then I do a, a video thing with the cigar boxes. So I tell them a little bit about the history of juggling. And so there's more, they go, okay, it's just not about just it's only juggling. There's more to it. It's more like a, they learn something. It's about some celebrities. and So they, they learn. Yes. Some stuff you you do need to 
change the pace sometimes. You can't just have juggling, 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 juggling. You got to. So if you have a little bit of a, a bit about the history of juggling with the cigar boxes, I understand that would be a great change of pace for the audience. And then I, uh, and then I do something with the, the Diablo, mm -hmm. the Chinese yo-yo, yep. and then I have a LED lights inside of the Diablo. So also then if we make it a little bit darker, but not like a full blackout. Right. It's, it's more like a performing piece. It makes it look more unique and, and bigger as well. Mm -hmm. And then I go to my uh, audience bit, audience member routine. So it makes it more personal again. What do you do with the and audience member? Also, what do you do with the audience member? I have a routine. Like I have a couple. I have a routine that I call an apple eating contest. <laughs> and I have a routine with a you get nice and you put a guy on the floor and you do a bunch of business with him. And then I have a, another one that I juggle the balls. Um, and that's more better for a kid or an old lady. And they right. have to catch the balls in a bag. Yeah. And then I had a, a thing with a hula hoop as well. So I have four different audience member routines that I can pick from. How do you pick your volunteer? Sometimes it's crucial to get the right person. Um, like it's... How do I pick them? I always look for... a person that doesn't look that grumpy and looks like he will be good sport yeah and but then also it depends like for when I put the guy on the floor usually I, I like somebody around their 40s mm -hmm. that are still young enough and healthy enough and to to lay down and stand up again yeah <laughs> but then for, for the kid routine you want to have a, a kid that's not too old not too young yeah kind of cute so uh, yeah when I can I just pre-select them I just look into the audience before the show yeah. and then I just go for a couple like okay this is my first choice this is my second choice this is my third choice so you do this but you leave, I, leave I, the show yeah I've done that as well plan B yeah before you said sorry sorry to keep them jumping in so yeah I do that as well sometimes actually before the show not during the show but before the show I'll be peeking out and seeing which table is laughing the most which which person might be the best volunteer because if you leave it to the last minute, you sometimes I make a mistake and I pick someone and they don't want to come up. If they don't want to come up, then the next person doesn't want to come up. And then nobody wants to come up and it's like, okay. <laughs> yeah, then it just <laughs> kills the show a little bit. Exactly. So you've got done the volunteer part. How long are you into the show now? Has it been 20 minutes, 30 minutes? Uh, that's about uh, 30 minutes. Yeah, I'd show. imagine so, yeah. And then, um, and then I want to... Yeah, finish on something. And then I do the ring juggling with UV light. Mm -hmm. Changes the scene of the stage again. And then I close on the light club routine. Wow. And people really like that. It's, and then again, it becomes kind of full circle. Then you started with something with the lights, and then you end with something with the lights. And yeah. It's kind of Fantastic. You can't out. see. I'm bowing down and clapping. Maybe you can hear the clapping. Yeah. yeah. I love it. Wow. What's what's in your bag? Not the bag that you take on stage, but the bag that you carry with you when you're doing going going to shows. So my bag, I'm opening up here. I got all kinds of weird things. I have an envelope, exact with um with plastic card inside, exactly the same size as a check. So if someone pays me okay. for a check, the check doesn't get creased. I've got. I've got lip balm because uh, if I'm working outside and it's cold, my lips will crack and my hands will crack. I've got a box of name cards, of course. Okay. Is there a, I've got nail clippers because I, I hate it when my nails get get start breaking during yeah. fast juggling. Is there, are there any specific things that you carry with you that aren't used on sh in the, on the show on stage but are always in well, your bag? One, one thing, maybe for um. What I did for the juggling hats. Oh yeah. When you fly with them, mm -hmm. like the rest of the weight of your luggage kind of fold, crumbles of your hats, just yes. make them not as stiff anymore, so yes. they ruin them more quickly. Yes. So what I did, I took uh, plastic uh, trash containers, small ones. Oh. And I cut like a brim, <laughs> so they can they can go in between the the felt uh, juggling hats. So they keep their stiffness. Ah, oh, that's brilliant! I love it. So that that's one that I I came up with. Um, also, when you have like a, a small plastic container where you put in maybe your batteries or mm -hmm. um, your ping pong balls to juggle, 
with a I, I poked a little hole in the lid okay. of those containers because of the air difference in the in the airplane. Ah, yes. Then otherwise it sucks in vacuum and it's very difficult to open the lid again. But if you have a little little hole in it, you can open the container very easily. Amazing. And and another good tip, like my friend Dan Holzman, from the who helped me, yeah. he just finished his book and I wrote the forward for it. It's a thousand and one tips for professional variety entertainers. Ah, oh, great. So that book will be released very, very soon and it will have a thousand and one tips just like this. These little book. things. Yeah. Fantastic. Oh, that's great. Another tip, um, always wear the same color underwear as your um, show pants. Oh, yeah. So that's another thing. Like one time I lost a bit of weight and it was funny because they... Uh, People say, oh, you probably ripped your pants on stage because you were too fat. So it's like, no, actually, I, I was working out and I lost some weight. But then the pants from my suit oh. went a little lower. So the crotch area goes a little lower, too. But then if you make a big bow, like a big pose, then, yeah, it's just more part. So then because of that, because the crotch was lower, it ripped the seam. <laughs> there. But it wasn't right at the end of my show. But, like, I was wearing black on the underwear and a black pants so it's, it's okay but then i realize always we're the same same if your zipper goes down you don't you don't know where if it's the same color it's like magic break. people don't really see it you know what that is so bizarre i have exactly the same issue in my mind right now that is so weird that is bizarre because um a lot of my act is is built around my trousers falling off because i i do um as I'm not so, uh, as I as I decided that five ball juggling wasn't really for me, I thought I'll emphasise more on the on the on the silly elements of my show. So for 25 years now, my trousers always fall off, and I have special zips to make my trousers fall off whenever I want to. Um, but the problem is, um, the elastic in the trousers um, starts to weaken after a while, and so when I pull the trousers up. Unless I keep on replacing them like every every two months, and I'm not going to do that. That would be a waste of money. The, the, the trousers slowly start to sag down slightly during my show. So my silly underwear starts to show again, and it just annoys me. And, my, yeah. and uh, the only thing I can think of at the moment is, uh, apart, from, apart from getting new elastic for my trousers, is, yeah, making sure that maybe, the tr maybe my silly underwear sort of maybe ma maybe it matches my t-shirt or my or my my jacket so that as the trousers fall down uh if my ta if my t-shirt's black and my underwear's black it will match and they they won't be so obvious that there's there's a, a great band of of pink or green or whatever the underwear is yeah so amazing i had the same issue that's fantastic <laughs> there you go <laughs> let's end it there that's brilliant <laughs> so that is neil's dunker super juggler Super performer, super businessman, an all-round fantastic nice guy. What a great start to season four. All right, I'll talk to you in a week or so. Take care. No, hold on. What's that, Ben? A new feature for season four? Yes, welcome, folks, to the after show. This is a new season, a new season, and this is a new... Ah, oh, come on. Let's try and get my tongue around these words. Let's try that again. This is a new season, huh? and this is a new feature on season four of Meet the Entertainers. This is just for the entertainers, and, well, let's be honest, it's basically for me, so I don't forget what I've learnt. In this season four, there is an after show, and you're listening to it right now. And in the after show, I will list all the various important things that I think I've learnt. So, uh, dear listener... If you're um, listening to this in the future and you want to uh, uh, get all the tips from a podcast, you can just skip to the end of the podcast, to the after show, and there'll be a nice long list of uh, all these amazing tips from these amazing performers such as Niels Dunker. Okay, what did Niels talk about? Well, as the garden weasel, it looks great for juggling, it looks dangerous, but it's safe enough to be allowed to uh, be carried on a plane as transport. Oh, sorry, not as transport. You can't fly on a garden weasel, that's not transport. Now the garden weasel can be carried uh, on a plane uh, as baggage. Great tip number two, 
um, his marketing. Niels has congruity in his branding. He has the same persona for marketing as he does when he's performing. It's all the same person. What about this for a tip for performers on cruise ships? Lights out at the start of your show so you don't get distracted by um, final members of the audience making their way into their seats. What a great tip. Another great tip, what a fantastic way to protect your hats when traveling by taking um, plastic waste paper butt bins and uh, cutting, cutting strips around to protect your hats. If you don't know what I'm talking about, go onto my website www.thebigbenshow.com Go onto my website where there will be a YouTube video of this podcast. Um, the YouTube video has photos so you can see what we're talking about. Photos of Neil's hats. Oh, flipping back to marketing again. Obviously I didn't really plan this list uh, properly. Well, um, yeah, going back to marketing, if you can get a world record, that really helps sell your show. And sometimes some of these records are pretty obscure. So even if you're like me and you haven't got a huge talent, you might just be able to set a world record. So I'm going to write to Guinness right now and tell them I've done the one hour mingle. Hmm. Of course, there are also some, 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 some great tips for, uh, for your trousers. You might want to coordinate the, your underwear <laughs> under your trousers with either your t-shirt or your trousers, depending on your style of show. In ca that's in case your trousers slip off. That's what I'm talking about, okay? Well, um, look, you know, I could go on talking for ages and ages about Neil's amazing tips, um, but I'm going to end right there. If you want to learn even more, just go to my website, www.thebigbenshow.com. Dot com. Uh, look at the podcasts and you'll see there's a, a video, or well, it will be pretty soon, a video of this podcast, uh, which will include some photos to help explain some of the stuff. And also, on that video, if I have time, there will be an after-after show with even more stuff. Hey, 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 yeah? Alright, talk to you again soon, guys. Bye-bye. <laughs>